back. <laughs> That's it. So, what we want to do is we want to set framework, okay? It's going to be a bit of a stop-start. Um, next week, Mark is going to be discussing Shabbat, okay? Try and get you guys a little bit into remembering why we celebrate it. And kind of just get back, back into the pictures and the imagery so that you can celebrate. So next week we will be discussing Shabbat, if you guys want to just Make a note of that, do some notes over there if you're looking for cross-referencing. I will give you Exodus 19 and 20. Okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna do seriously go into it the whole way through, it's gonna be from 19 all the way through to chapter 32 of Exodus. So there's a lot of there's a lot of homework. I want you to cross-reference that with Acts 2. Okay. Hopefully we've done, we didn't do too many cross-references cross with our map, but maybe we can lead up to that. Alright, so but that's basically where we're going to be We're going to be at. But today, um, yeah, I was stuck between two, two books really. Part of me wanted to take you guys through Daniel, and another part of me thought Joshua was, was, um, was what we were going to go, what we were going to get to. So, the moment Joshua kept on coming up, so I think we're going to go with that. Like I said to you, but I don't want to just talk about the breakdown of Joshua in this session. I want to talk to you about the buildup of Joshua the man. Okay, so he who was who was. Tell me a little bit about the man. Tell me, tell me about. Well, let's start with the name. Name, name says a lot. It's the name. Yeah, it's the Okay, so he started off as. Oh, Yeshua. Yeshua, or you'll probably get some translation as a word, Yeshua. It's Yeshua, okay? And then later, something happens near the end of Moses' life. Name changes. God adds a letter. What letter does he add? Yeah, Yeshua. The Yud, which is the equivalent of your wife. Yes. Okay? That's the way they write it. Yeah, Yeshua. Okay, so what does Washua mean? Okay, it comes from the same root as saves. We can say salvation, it's a slightly different word. Okay? It comes from the same root, but it doesn't actually mean salvation. Okay? That's where we get Yeshua. It's a slightly different thing, slightly different in uh, pronunciation. Okay? Because it comes from a different, well, it's, it's a similar root as in the Shua, the same thing, but obviously we also have a Yud and it's probably pronounced Ye or Yashua. Okay? Um, right, so we're talking about saves. So in his own strength, he saves. But I want you to do, what I want you to start thinking about now is this cross referencing between God training up Moses to train up Joshua. Right, there is a tell me rabbi relationship going on here. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, okay, so basically what happens is a rabbi means an exalted one because he has now um, been lifted up by God. Trains up people to become like him, to walk like him, so to become the next leader. Okay, so God understands that. I'm going to lift up Moses. Israel is leaderless. Yes? Yes. They're sitting in Mitzrayim. They've got a couple of their little sort of probably chieftains and probably some of the people that they're touching. But in reality as a nation, they don't have someone there to pick them up and run with them. They've kind of assimilated in many cases. So a lot of them are not even looking to the leadership of God. So he sends a man to show them back to God. Yes. What's it? Where can you should be doing parallels to Gospels, right? There is a link that gets lost. Okay? So as, say now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and that sort of become assimilated in that, where do we get the Sadducees from? Where do they come from? No. I, 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 wish, I wish it was. It's not. Sadducees or something else. 
Back in Daniel's time, building up to the time of, well, not Daniel, but building up from Daniel, when you start talking about leading up, so much I love, leading up from Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes and him coming down. Remember Antiochus? Yeah. See why I wanted to go to Daniel. Antiochus comes in, does a whole bunch of things that gives us pictures of Antichrist, etc., etc. Maccabees come and kick him out. After the Maccabees come in, we get two separate types of Jews. We start to come sort of like pseudos or people that are going to be building up to. We have the Chasdim. What, if, what does it mean if I say you Hasidic? Upright, pious. Okay, you Dati. Dati, yeah, a Sadiq is a righteous person. A Dati is an ultra religious man. Okay, when we say are you Hasidic? That's generally what we see in Israel today. The picture is the, the black suits, the payot, the beard. That's a Hasidic. Okay? Hasidic. They're fruit. Okay? You get many, many different little, 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 little interesting names for these guys. Okay? That's sort of like a Hasidic. Has okay? Alright? And then you get... Um, are you going to get Hasidic? And then you get sort of like um, what I'm going to call is the Hamas sympathizers. Yeah, that's probably spelled wrong, right? Is there some? Sympathy. Sympathizers. Help me out, so is it a zero? Is it? Is it? What's wrong? What's wrong? Compared to in America, yeah, yeah. So much of American people, man. Halas. Where do we get the term halas from? House point. No. Greek. Greek. Greeks. Okay. They don't call themselves. They don't call themselves Greeks. They call them Hellenists. Hellenism comes from the term Greece, which is halas. Okay. So we get these. I want you to parallel Roman sympathize. Okay? So we get the guys that are ultra orthodox, that want to stick to just Torah, want to be focused on just what God said, and then you get the guys that are saying, Greeks, the modern culture, guys, we need to move out of the Stone Ages. Come on now, let's enjoy a little bit of this the theater, the hippodromes, the sports, the lives in this modern culture. Okay? So we get this, we need to sort of move in, and then we don't. What happens is we kind of get the Chazdim, which became the beginning of a Pharisee, and our Halas, our Roman sympathizers, are the guys we call Sadducees. Uh, come ah. Yeah, I'm sleeping today. Then where did the Essenes come from? Essenes were a completely different animal altogether. <laughs> <laughs> the Essene community was so sick and tired of hypocrisy in Jerusalem, they decided to become an all-male community with an adoption agency policy that said we would now come out <coughs> And we will become to, uh, they call themselves the people preparing the way in the wilderness. They call themselves sons of light fighting against the sons of darkness. Sons of darkness were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people there were, were so compromised, they didn't even know what Torah was anymore. I smiled though, because the scenes went completely off a lunar calendar and followed a solar one. Is that when we talk about the zealots? Rather than the zealots again, or another crowd. Okay, what one there, right? We're talking about the scenes. Was John the Baptist in the scene? Possible. Okay. Because there's a difference to the Sons of Thunder. Now, the Sons of Thunder. It's nothing to do with that. No, the Sons of Thunder were just because they were pretty much bad tempered. All right. The Sons of Thunder. All right. So we have. Okay. Why were there five? Four of those five major groups. There were probably 20, 20 odd subsections in the time of Yeshua. Okay, when you look at the same community, they were dead six scrolls, all male, had that adoption agency possible. Uh, you know, if you wanted to come in there, they believed that they were the temple, right? New Testament thinking, very much in an Essene frame of reference. We are the new temple, not, not that thing in Jerusalem. Okay? We, we, we. We are the ones preparing the way for all this. We are the ones that the sons of light taking on the, taking on the sons of darkness. But the problem is they also went a little bit skewed. It's not good for men to be alone. So they didn't want to defile themselves by having wives. Okay? 
They they took they took on small people. They took on anybody that actually wanted to come into the community. For the first year, you would basically go through this this process. I would give my 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 wealth, and I would put it in in this communal this communal bank, and I would work there for a year. And if I was accepted, then I could stay. There. These guys studied Torah for probably about two or three hours every night. Not not playing games. These guys were extremely devout. Extremely passionate. But even in their passion, they got some things wrong. They considered it work if you needed to go make stinky on Shabbat. And they would write it down as a mark against you. They went on to a solo calendar. They believed it was revealed to them, so they had the true calendar. Sound familiar? Everybody has a new true calendar. Okay? Ultimately, we have to come down to what's God's calendar and what's not. Alright? And obviously, in our time, Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of these new phases coming in every time. But does it line up with scripture? Okay? So as much as the scenes were something something very interesting and you know we can thank them for the Dead Sea Scrolls, which gave us a lot of a lot of information. You know that they consider the Dead Sea Scrolls one of the biggest finds of century. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Why? Because it, it, it gave cost light back on on what happened literally thousands of years ago. <laughs> Proves that the translation that we've got today is pretty accurate. Okay. But the scriptures that we have today. Right. Okay, as well as? Well, in the middle ages, we've lost a lot of the writings. And now we found that. Okay, so basically, I'm not, right? Sorry, also that many of the scriptures in the past wasn't preserved properly and pieces were missing and it got lost. So to find it in a more modern age. Um well, yes, we do. But I mean, what we found basically gave us by in the book of Esther is that this is pretty much 99% the same of what we have. Mm -hmm. So when people were questioning the validity of scripture, Broken telephone, guys, come on. A scribe making a scribe error, they copy the scribe error, then the scribe makes another error, then in generation after generation, 2,000 years. You cannot tell me your Bible is the same. Enter Dead Sea Scrolls, well, actually it is. Right? And then just when they questioned that, they found another little piece. It's a lovely little little scroll. It's about that big. They found in they found in Israel, this, uh, what they did was they found this little, this little uh, pendant for a necklace. And when they opened it up, what they saw in the paleo was the ironic blessing. Right. And that predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by a thousand years. <laughs> they considered that the prize possession in the entirety of the museum. And the right? It's that big. They've unrolled it, they've enlarged it so that you can see it, and then they've translated it for you. You can buy the little pendant that the Golden Tool will have on. Yeah? yeah, there we go. George's got a copy of it. A... Yeah, good man. Alright, uh, Johnny, if you want to hold it in your hand and just pass it around to show you the size of this thing. Now, this was rolled up in a little scroll. Yeah, just, just walk there. Okay? Then they just, they just have this thing. So again, God says, okay, you want to question whether or not my word stays the same as is written in Numbers. God drops the mic and says, thanks very much, no more questioning my translation. Okay? New Testament was a little easier because we have more copies of it and we can trace it back a lot better than we're talking about something that happened with David 3,000 and therefore the Exodus probably 4,000 years ago. Yeah, what they were doubting is um, that the Jewish nation had existed. Yeah, well, that there was an actually Hebrew nation or anything like that. And, that, that. and that's in your the Gospels, you know, which was written by different people, and you start to get the these funds. Yeah. Up. And also points out to something extremely important here. How many of you know, even now in our times, we were questioning which translation is more correct? Alright, so now we have we have King James, <coughs> but you know, come on, it's English, it's not Hebrew. But we don't even know if they spoke Hebrew, so many people lean towards the Greek. Now we don't know because that's where we have our, our, our last reliable copies from, but now there's been, probably in the last 10 or 15 years ago, there's been a big push for the Aramaic. 
You have to have an Aramaic Pesheta, an Aramaic translation, because that's more, it's closer to the Hebrew. But because we don't even know if they did, they did have a Hebrew copy. That became into, into well, we don't know what the lingua franca at the time was. Dead Sea Scrolls settled that debate. Even though we found Aramaic and some Greek scripts or scrolls in the caves, 90% of it was written in Hebrew. When we have our, when we found things of Austria, little pieces of pottery that have little notes written on. When we found archaeologically things that were written, there were stones written in Yeshua's time, that you can go look at the, in the museum itself, there's one stone that, that they found there that said to the place of the trumpeter at the southern wall excavations, to the highest point of the temple, that was not written in Aramaic, it was written in Hebrew. All right? So the more we look back to the evidence that we have, and that backed up quite a bit, it pointed, it made first, first basis is that Hebrew was the language of the time. Not taking away the fact that they probably would have spoken, or the learned person would have had some Aramaic, a lot of Greek. Why? Because of languages. Tell me where we get the languages from. Came from right, Aramaic we picked up in Babylon. Okay, but we were, only, we were only there for a little bit of time. So before that, we have Hebrew, which is kind of interesting because when we look at Daniel, Daniel is written in two languages. Okay, Hebrew, Hebrew up until a point, Aramaic to a point, Hebrew again. So it believes, it leads us to believe that God wants to use a language to reach the Babylons that they had no excuse, they didn't understand what was going on. Well, isn't the first chapter and a half of um, Daniel actually by Nebuchadnezzar? No, probably it's not. Just, it's it's one 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 well, you, 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 probably dream and things like that. you probably would have been interviewed by someone and then written down. Remember, he would have, Daniel would have had to go and he had the interpretation of the dream that was going on. So he could have filled in the rest of the story as, as in what, what would have happened. Okay? But in Nebuchadnezzar's hand, that's the Hebrew portion. Later, I uh, believe it, the Aramaic only started. And I'll, I'll get the exact, I'll get the person. Hebrew, Aramaic. Yeah, it's Hebrew, Aramaic, Hebrew again. So I'll get the exact breakdown for you um, to, to go in there. Anyway. So we go from Hebrew to Aramaic, we pick up Aramaic, Aramaic in Babylon. Next we have Greek. Where do we get Greek Greek from? Obviously Hellenism. Okay, when we get Hellenism coming in, who brought in Hellenism? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Okay, I did not come to conquer you guys and take away your gods. I only came to bring my culture. Oh, I'll for music. <laughs> We have this Alexander doing something very sneaky. He comes in and then he goes, I don't want to conquer you guys. I just want to share who we are. Enter gymnasium, gymnas. What's the word gymnas mean? Naked. Naked. Gymnasium means nakedness. Isn't that nice? Right, so we want to bring those things in. Let me just, let me just tell you. The name fits the exercise. Okay? If, two, if two people wanted to think about the guys, gymnos was for men, gymnasium was for guys. Ladies were not around there. In these bathhouse complexes, you had a, you had a gymnasium. You had sections where you can build up a bit of a sweat. Because why? You want to get all this stuff out, and then you can go take a nice little lukewarm bath or a hot bath and you can open up the pores and you can put oil and you can scrape all the gunk off and you can have conversations and you can have business meetings and that's what this bathhouse complex was. Okay? But we have pictures and we have details of the way they did it was in the news. So if two guys wanted to work up a bit of sweat they would fight for and wrestle. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No take it? No one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> two, two, two rather naked people with, with some olive oil on 
And you're going to build up some sweat, and then we're going to go have a bath together, and it's going to be all about camaraderie. Right. Needless to say, um, there was a little bit of a homosexual complex in Greece. I don't know why. Well, no, who would have imagined that would come up? Okay? But then again, we come up to this idea. Right. And that's where we get Greek and Hellenism and all those good things from. What did the Romans bring? No, damage men, folks. Okay. So when they came in, basically New Testament time, the most spoken language was probably Greek. Why? Right? Because that's what we had, the infrastructure's already there. And so if we wanted to go out because of Alexander the Great's great empire, everybody was Hellenized, so guess what guys? They all understand Greek already, so let's just use that. And then as Rome came in there, for them themselves, they would use Latin, okay? So we have different aspects, and we would go into our translations. We would have Vulgate, Septuagint, then you have the Aramaic Pasheta, and now we have Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that that show us actually the Hebrew translations works. And we've got guys, professors, that have taken the Greek translations of the New Testament, and they have back-translated it into the Hebrew. And they found that the idioms that do not exist in the Greek language work perfectly in the Hebrew. Okay? Let me give you one. You tell that fox. In Greek, that means nothing. We kind of understand it in English today to mean, oh well, you were telling him he was cunning. In Hebrew, it means, you tell that Lincoln poop. <laughs> right, makes perfect sense to a Hebrew speaking person and they would go, that's a bit rough. In that time, it made perfect sense. In Greek and in Latin and those things, it didn't. We never had an idiom for that. The finger of God. Ooh, okay, you know, Greek thinking. Can you imagine who's coming down and... <laughs> no, that's a Hebrew idiom for the Ruach of Kadesh, the Holy Spirit. And the more we translate it back, the more we see these things put into place. Never mind the fact that they found in, uh, in various places, in, including the vaults of the Vatican, original, well, let's not say all the way back to your shortest time, but transcripts of probably the second or third copy, if I understood correctly, of a Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's what Hebrew is. Um, you copied away from And the whole the way the language flows is completely different to Greek. Greek's more clinical, I suppose, probably where we get into our line of thinking, and Hebrew's completely different. Okay? Can you just explain... Hebraism is a word found in Hebrew. Yeah. Where you actually play words off against one another. That's Yeshua, Hoshua, you know, and those sort of things. Where you come into this and there's a meaning behind it, but then it comes down to a shortage. Right? Okay? So, it was kind of a big thing. Alright? I don't even know why we did But anyway, Zealots. Zealots were extremely passionate. Passionate about... Uh, Torah are passionate about serving God only, and they will not bow down to any Roman deity. Okay, that's death or God. There's no in between. Okay, different different subgroups. Okay, and then the last ones were major group was Hasmoneans. Hasmoneans were basically the old royalty from the time of the Magnates. Okay, from the time of. The Maccabees. Maccabees. And the Maccabees came over, and remember they established the kingship and the high priestly order again. Matthias was the guy who started the revolt, the father of Judah the Maccabee. Mm -hmm. Right? He came in and he sort of, um, he, was, he was part of the Kohanim, so they were part of the Levitical group. And then they went in and they established the kingship, they established everything as they, as they came in. And from that lineage, we find someone in the New Testament that heard the great news. <coughs> Anybody have a clue? Miriamna. Miriamna. Right. His favorite wife, see, he marries her to solidify his claim on the throne. But he got his claim on the throne from whom? From Rome. Rome said, now you go and you take it because they kicked him out a little bit before that. And he sort of gets established by Rome, even though Antipater, his father, was in control of that region. You have a young Herod and a young Fazael running things. Underneath Antipater, Antipater dies, revolt happens, Fazael gets murdered, 
Herod runs for his life. He goes to Rome and he says, Mark Anthony, help a brother out. Mark Anthony says, my boy, you go down there with our authority. And he becomes Herod the Great. And he establishes this, this uh, well, you could, you could say it like this. He, he became like the mayor government, fake king that gets put into place. Okay, under Roman power was Roman agenda. All right. Um, he establishes, he takes Miranda, his favorite wife, and later strangles her because there was a rumor that she had an affair. Yeah. Right, but don't worry, he built a nice little tower for her because he yeah. felt bad. <laughs> okay, one of the three qualifications near Jeff again. <laughs> Alright, um, uh, yeah. just while we're there, Herod, Herod was what? He was from Idumea, okay? Just before, what? You know, there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a, you know, I'll follow him. Herod, Herod didn't like the Jews very much. Why? It was just a prophecy. He hated them before that. They challenged his authority. They did not before that. When did they challenge him? Herod didn't like them. Jews. Because of the No. Wasn't there a forced... Um, it's a conversion. It was, it was a first when they came in. When these guys, when Matthias and them came in, and they expanded their territory, anybody that was in the region were forced to convert to Judaism. No more Hellenism here. We are all going to be Chasdim, right? Because Antiochus put in Jason or Jonathan before. And he brought in Hellenism and he gave Antiochus revenue from temple and all the rest of it. So now, later, Omaius, the third comes in and he as high priest says, No more of this Hellenism rubbish, we're shutting it down. You will be Jews, we will follow Torah, and I don't want any mixture. And he included whoever was around. The Edomites, the Edomites were there and he converted them too. You have your choice. Right? So you all get converted. Antipater comes in. He's an Edomite. But he's Jewish because of a conversion that happened. So now we get a half Edomian, half Jew background. But he was very likely part of, well, some believe in Arab descent. Edomites. Okay? Not really Ishmaelite. Edomite. But he was separate. And he came in with this identity. And we have this Edomian half Esau, half Yaakov by first conversion come in and these guys revolt against him and his brother. They kill Fazael, his brother. He's a young man at this time. He's like 12 or 13. But not only did you force your conversion on us, not only did you rejoice when my father died, but you killed my brother and now I must sit here and I must smile at you. When I get back here with Roman gods, you guys are going to know what it's going to be like to be conquered. You kind of see how the backdrop changes the perception of just, okay, he was a matter, but plain and simple. His hatred for what they did to his brother established basically, and that kind of grew <coughs> to the point where Herod the Great became Herod the Great. Any insurrection, any thought of insurrection against me, the last time we maybe heard about it, and I don't know if this is fact, but maybe there was a little hint or a little clue before. My brother died because of insurrection. Bring a revolt. Let's see what happens. He wasn't going to make that same mistake twice. Okay? Anyway, his hatred leads to his dynasty. And that becomes basically his legacy. And that's basically how he to get his scrolls. And we have no idea why we're talking about this. But anyway. So let's try Joshua. Yes, filling in the gaps. Lovely. All right. <laughs> Now, we've obviously studied Torah. You've been given a, a lesson from Bereshit. From the beginning, we get our story traditionally probably from when Moshe was sitting at, at, on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he goes in and he goes, well, okay, you're the God of... And he says, well, where, what, what's your story? And God tells him a little, a little story about Adam and Eve and how...